Unbelievably, we are only about a month away from the first two Democratic primary debates, and the two frontrunners may not even go head to head. So when former Vice President Joe Biden and Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders take the stage in June and July for the first primary debates, who they go up against and when is completely random. Under the rules drawn up by the DNC, the 20 candidates participating will be divvied up randomly into two groups, and they will appear on consecutive nights. That same process will then be utilized for the July debate as well. Here to discuss, I thought maybe Sagar would jump in here as well, <laughs> but I'll just do the whole intro. Here to discuss whether this is the best way to handle the debates and to weigh in on the 2020 Democratic primary is Emma Vigeland. She is a political correspondent for TYT, the Progressive Web Video Network. Emma, great to see you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so we have a little bit of new polling here out uh, from the Hill. It shows some of the trends that other polls are picking up on. Still Biden with a very strong lead, 33%, and Sanders then uh, coming in at 14%. What do you make of Biden's strength so far? Yeah, so I think that what we're kind of zeroing in on is that there's a whole concern about electability with the Democratic electorate. We are so traumatized by the Trump administration, I'd include myself in the progressive wing, obviously, um, that people just want to beat Trump at any cost. And there is this consistent media narrative that Joe Biden is the best person to defeat Donald Trump. Now, I would push back against that uh, vociferously, uh, and I would say that you know, we saw what happens when the centrist goes up against Donald Trump, when someone who uh, proposes milk toast policies, a return to normalcy, that kind of neoliberal centrism, we see how that works mm. out, and we saw it play out with Hillary Clinton. And I would argue that Joe Biden's record is worse than Hillary Clinton's. Hillary ended up flipping on the bankruptcy bill to the side to voting with it, but Joe Biden was pushing for it in all three iterations of it, voting for it over and over again. His position on the crime bill is obviously problematic. You go back to the 1970s, and he was arguing against school and integration. I mean, every political moment that you look at, Joe Biden hasn't really been on the right side. And I think that those issues are going to become more clear to the Democratic electorate as the primary process goes on. We have to remember, Jeb Bush was leading uh, when the field was this crowded back uh, in the 2016 race. So I'm not going to put too much stock into it, but I will say I am surprised that he's holding on for this long. Well, that, so that the Bush comparison is important because it's not exactly the same. He was leading up until Trump jumped in the race. Trump pretty much topped the polls about two weeks into his entrance. So at this point, I mean, we've pretty much, I hope that the electorate, or that, sorry, that the field is as big as it's going to get. But we can tell from this polling that there's a pretty consistent 33% size. And I think that the number is important. It's exactly the same that Trump had hmm. going into those primaries. It's the one third of that base that is coalesced around Joe Biden. Do you worry that other progressives are competing with each other and allowing Biden to possibly just run away with it? Because that's what happened in 2016 with the Republican Party. Yeah, so I think yeah. that's a really good point. Um, but I would say that the difference between what Joe Biden is to the Democratic electorate, the progressive electorate, and what Trump was to the Republican electorate is very different. So mm -hmm. Trump spoke to a uh, a voice in the Republican Party. He said the quiet part loud, the racist part loud, and he also spoke to economic anxiety in the middle of the country. Joe Biden doesn't speak to any of the key issues that the Democratic electorate cares about. The, uh, the progressive base wants Medicare for all. They want a Green New Deal, which Joe Biden has equivocated on or has said that he's not. he wants a middle ground approach. They want all of these policy positions, and I think that that's going to become more clear, as I said before, as the process plays out. Um, and, and, and secondly, I would argue that Biden's support is kind of based uh, on hot air and nostalgia about the Obama administration and the return to normalcy. But once voices start to get heard, I think that's going to matter a lot less. Mm -hmm. So that's an anecdotal kind of my reading of the situation. Um, so it's not going to bear out bear itself out in the numbers. But the fact that Biden and Bernie Sanders are pretty much tied in Iowa, uh, which is the state that's going to start the dominoes falling, I think that that kind of speaks to what I'm talking sure. about. I also think on this idea of electability, Biden's got a big problem in the general election, which is trade. It's trade and it's China. We were right. talking about this earlier. We were just talking about yes. it in the green room. I mean, I think a lot of uh, cable news producers really underestimate how important an issue trade is in those key Midwestern states where Democrats have to win. And Joe Biden is just flat out wrong on the issue and has not changed his position. 
Oh, and has uh, dug in as his his, right. his his instinct. It's almost Trumpian, where he doubles down. He says, I'm the most progressive candidate in the race. Look at my record. Dude, we did, and that's the whole problem. Yeah. Uh, and Still supports NAFTA, right? right? Still supports TPP, says China's no big deal, don't worry about it. And as the poll numbers bear out, Bernie Sanders' strongest area is in the Midwest, where trade deals have ravaged uh, th those areas the, uh, the toughest. So yeah. I think that he could have a, 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 you know, a resurgence there. And we saw it also in 2016 when the average polling for him in Michigan was down 16 points, and he ended up eking out a victory there. So. Uh, I think that, as you were alluding to, the numbers in the Midwest and the, number, and the discussion around trade is seriously undervalued. One thing I'd love to get your take on, and this is the, Biden, uh, is the Bernie versus Warren tactic. So Bernie has kind of tried to rise above it all, doesn't talk about impeachment. He doesn't get embroiled in the day-to-day -day politics of the day. But Elizabeth Warren's numbers have been going up consistently in national polls because while she'll still strike that anti uh, the anti-free trade agreement, the pro-worker, uh, all this progressive policy, she's willing to say, let's impeach. She's willing to go in on the Mueller report. And that's not really at the core of Bernie's support. Does Bernie suffer for not getting involved in the day-to-day -day politics? Yeah, I think that's also a really good mm -hmm. question. I'm not exactly sure if impeachment is the exact reason for her rise. I think she's starting to rightly get headlines because every week she comes out with a very specific and detailed policy proposal. And as we've seen, her student debt proposal right. and her ideas around that are really hitting at the core of an economic anxiety that a lot of people are, are feeling right now. People, younger people, that's arguably, you know, their number one issue or their top three issue because student debt has handcuffed so many people, so many uh, millennials and, and people in my generation from participating in the economy. So I think that has been a really big boost to her. But, you know, I, I saw Chris Hayes tweeted that he sees this real tortoise in the hair uh, uh, dynamic happening with Elizabeth Warren, and I, I can't say I disagree hmm. because I think that the fact that she's putting out all of these substantive things is really making her stand out. Yeah. In addition, uh, with the impeach impeachment thing that you're pointing to, because yeah. I we can't underestimate how much the Democratic electorate wants Trump out of office yes. and wants him to be a one-term president, right. um, impeached or otherwise. And, and my theory with Warren is that she would be polling even stronger if people didn't have electability questions about her. Exactly. And I think she really exacerbated that issue for herself with the DNA testing thing, playing yeah. into Trump's day-to-day <laughs> -day bashing. I think that really raised a lot of questions for people about whether she was the person who could actually beat Donald Trump, even though they may like her. But I wanted to ask you specifically, what did you think of her take on why she's not doing the Fox News town hall? What did she call it? A hate? Hate for profit. Hate for profit. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm torn on this issue as I am with many issues involving Bernie versus Warren, because I think they're both phenomenal candidates. Um, but I would err more on the side of what Bernie did, which is go into the lion's den. And you saw the reaction that the Fox News viewers had when he talked about Medicare care right. for all. Even with and the Trump's reaction, he hated it. Oh my God! He <laughs> and he got 3.6 million mm. viewers. That's yeah. more than Sean Hannity gets in a night. Wow! So exactly, yeah. and I don't think that it serves Elizabeth Warren to avoid uh, those discussions, especially if she wants to be a successful general election right. candidate. Because, like it or not, Fox News is the number one cable news uh, channel in this country and is incredibly influential, not just uh, in, in conservative circles, but on the national discourse. Because people still take them seriously. I may not like it, but they're incredibly powerful monetarily and over the uh, national conversation. So I, I, I agree with Bernie Sanders' tactic more than hers. I think you make a good point, and this is something we've talked about here a lot, which is a lot, yes, you can believe that Fox doesn't come in good faith. I happen to think that most of the people there do, but the viewers do not come there in a bad faith. Right. They come there to actually, you know, hear the take. It's something they may have grown up on. It's something that is involved and embedded within their community or their family. They're going there to actually get information. Getting unvarnished airtime on the on the nation's most popular cable news network is a good thing. 
and and yeah. it and it brings talking points to people who are fed nonstop propaganda mm -hmm. and are only hearing about how the immigrants are coming to take your jobs and they're coming or if there's to a socialist or whatever. Crime. I mean, if you want to prove you're not a socialist or if you want to prove why it being a socialist is something that's fine, nothing is better than going and presenting. Yeah, I mean, case Warren's yourself. been completely caricatured there, right. and that would be an opportunity for her to sort of pop that bubble. Exactly, and I think that the the paradigm that people are most wrong about right now in in when we're talking about politics is right versus uh, left and that the center is in the middle of those two. Now, mm -hmm. there's a populism that's being completely underestimated when you when you look at polling and when you talk about uh, who's going to be uh, president in 2020, because I, I really believe that Bernie's core message of populism is way more appealing to right. independent voters than that of I don't know, Amy Klobuchar. Populism or is the Joe center, Biden. right? It's like it the majority of the country That's actually right. does agree with all of this. It's only the neoliberals in Washington that are on the left and the right of particular right. issues, but actually pretty united, that are the fringe people. Right, right? exactly. Yeah. Do you see any, um, you know, you kind of have your finger on the pulse of, of what's bubbling up across the country. Do you see any sort of sleeper issues that aren't getting the attention by the national networks in particular? I mean, last time around, this trade issue really bubbled up, plus the opioid crisis really sort of came to the forefront when candidates were out doing town halls and it kept getting raised time and time again. Is there something like that that, that you see sort of bubbling up? Well, you know, I, I on cable news, there is never an anti-war position, right? right? So it's always just more about belligerence, more about interference. And I actually think that especially in the Democratic primary, people really do care about not getting involved in wars anymore. I mean, the reaction that we're seeing about Iran, even across the board, across ideological ideological uh, perspectives is no, we don't want to get involved. Yeah. And yeah. that's not just the Democratic base. But but something that I wish the Democrats would focus on more is the idea of political corruption. Because when you talk to regular people, everyone wants money out of politics, every single one. And the only two candidates really, that the major candidates who are running on small dollars and not a lot of big donations are, uh, I mean, they all are to an extent, but only on that is right. Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. Yeah. They're just too afraid and they're too nice to call out their Democratic colleagues <laughs> and be like, yeah, Joe Biden's meeting with this pharmaceutical executive and that's actually going to really influence his position on health care and right. make sure that your health care is less affordable. They should be more uh, aggressive in that and I, I wish that they would be. Yeah, there was a most recent New York Times story. Joe Biden is raising money from the richest Democrats within the party, from the traditional Wall Street pharmaceutical base. Learn yeah. nothing. Yeah, He's right. more out of touch than Hillary Clinton and I didn't think that was human possible. <laughs> All right. I think well that's said. our headland. Yeah, yeah, there <laughs> there. We go. Emma, thank you. Great Thanks to have so you. Much. Thank you, Emma. Yeah. Uh, we'll have more coming up for you on Rising.